Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you for being here bright and early and on time. It's good to see everyone. Anyone go to the party last night? Anybody go to the Rackspace party last night? How was it? I missed it. Is it great? I know the venue looked really nice. Um, we were here having a good time. We had a party amongst ourselves. All right, so yeah, great time here. Um, you all are in hands-on Nova. That's the course you're in, all right? Hands-on, uh, which means hopefully you have something to put your hands on. Um, hopefully you bought a laptop, a machine of some sort, because uh, we're going to dive in and actually get to use uh, Nova and get to experience that. Quick survey before we jump in. Uh, how many of you all have actually used Nova before? You, you've had hands-on experience with Nova. So what you guys do, come here to teach the class? I mean, just, all right, okay, so we expect each of every one of you, you've been knighted as uh, tutors. So we expect you to help your neighbors for those who may not have used it before. So feel free to, to move around and help folks who are using this. All right, so before we get started, did want to do a few introductions. Just so you know the folks in the room that are going to be here to kind of help you out and, and walk you through this stuff. Okay, I'm going to start here with the gentleman to my left here. This is, well, not this left, all the way to the left. Uh, this is Mr. Byron McCollum. Say hello to the people. Hello. That's his speech. All right, this is Byron McCollum. He's uh, one of our senior instructors at Rackspace. Uh, his job is to fly all over the world and teach people about OpenStack. Um, so we're very happy to have him today, here today. He is the wizard behind most of what you're going to be seeing here today. Um, so if stuff goes really, really well, uh, he did it. If stuff goes really, really bad, <laughs> he's going to blame the rest of us. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That's Byron McCollum. Also over here, I have Mr. Phil Hopkins. All right, Phil Hopkins is also one of our senior instructors. Uh, like Byron, he flies all over the world, teaches this stuff to folks. Say hello to the folks. Hello, everybody. He's, he had at least four words. All right, good, good job. All right. Um, Phil Hopkins uh, teaches our OpenStack Fundamentals course, as does Byron. Uh, Phil also teaches our networking course. Um, so our course on Neutron, uh, Phil created that course and teaches that course. So um, if you want to hit him with hard questions around Neutron, uh, he's, he's more than willing to take those questions, all right? Um, he's also got just about every Red Hat certification there is. So if you have any Red Hat questions, unless you work for Red Hat, um, you can talk to him too. All right, and then also we have over here Mr. John McKenzie. John McKenzie is another one of our senior instructors. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Yes, they're getting longer and longer. These guys do talk. You know, you wouldn't think they talk, all right? He's one of our seniors instructors, um, also teaches fundamentals and the Building Cloudy Apps course that we have. So he has a software development background. Uh, so any software developers interested in the APIs, um, how to make apps cloud aware, uh, you can ping him with questions as well, okay? Um, and then I'm Tony Campbell. Um, I uh, keep the trainers happy. That's my job. Uh, so I, I just try to make sure they are um, on the road teaching and are happy. Um, and so uh, the four of us together here from Rackspace are going to help with a hands-on Nova session. But before we go too much further, I wanted to introduce some dear, dear friends of ours who are joining us in this venture. And actually, none of this would be possible without this team that I'm going to introduce. Um, in the back of the room, acting like he's, yeah, there he is. In the back of the room, acting like he's working hard, Mr. Young Se Song. In the back, he's from AMD C Micro. All right, we also have Vince Gonzalez right up here in the front. All right, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pete. Let me get it right, Yamaski? Yamsaki. Yamsaki. Yeah. See, man, I'm weak. This is Pete. Pete's also from AMD C Micro, and we want to give Pete a chance to kind of greet you all and, and share some things with you about our session today. So thank you all, and that's yours. Thank you, Tony. And just real quick, uh, before you guys get started here, we want to let you know what made this possible. What's your training running on? It's running in a data center. Where is that data center? That data center is in the back of the room. Wave Youngsei, uh, if, if there's any problems, if you file a ticket, the hardware needs to be replaced, Youngsei is there to do that for you. So we've worked with Rackspace to put this together. Essentially, our box is a data center in a box. You can run all of OpenStack in the box. Uh, what is the system? It's a 10RU chassis that has 64 to 256 power efficient servers. It's got network uplink cards, a shared storage controller. You could expand that storage to over five petabytes, and we've got a high performance fabric tying it all together, and that's what makes this OpenStack deployment possible. Um, I won't spend a lot of time telling everybody about that. I want you guys to learn something, get your training started, but if you're interested to learn more about our chassis, come and see us. Um, Vince, 
and Youngsei and myself will be here after the, after the training to answer any questions. Please go to the back of the room, take a look at the box, see what you've been running your training on. And if you want even more details, come and see us later today. We're sponsoring the Developer Lounge. If you're an active technical contributor, um, you'll be able to come into the lounge, you'll be able to talk to us, you'll be able to touch it, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, guys. Okay, good deal. Um, all right, so once again, thank you to AMD C Micro um, for helping us pull this thing off without them. It would not be possible. Um, if you get a chance, I would recommend uh, during the, the time, if you walk back there with Young Say and take a peek at what this thing's running on, it's pretty cool. Um, pretty impressive device. So I'm trying to buy one, but my corporate card won't let me <laughs> slide it, but we're working on that. All right. Okay, gang, let's go ahead and get started. All right, I'm gonna give you some instructions. Here's the way this is gonna work. I'm gonna give you some instructions on how to access our lab, okay? Also, how to log on to the data center back there, uh, into the cloud. Um, and then we're gonna give you some instructions that you can run and actually to get Nova working. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna surf around the room and kind of help you work through these exercises. Every once in a while, we may jump up here and show you something on the screen to make sure everybody's on the same page. But this is going to be a real fun, informal, throw your hand up if you have a question. If we're not coming to you quick enough, throw a shoe. That usually gets us there quicker. Um, and whatever you need, we're, we're here to help and kind of get you that experience, hands-on experience with uh, Nova. All right? You want to do this part? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so I'm doing this part, but he should be doing this part. Okay, but here we go. You can play Vanna. All right. So there's three things we need to, we need to um, share with you before we get started. Three things. Uh, we're going to tell you about the Wi-Fi in order to get onto our lab. We're going to tell you about the credentials you need in order to log in to our OpenStack cluster. And then instructions for executing different Nova commands out there. Okay? So let's start with the Wi-Fi. All right. We have a Wi-Fi running under the SSID of Rackspace. Password is also Rackspace. So if you want to do this hands-on lab, you need to be on Rackspace, Rackspace, all right? This is different from the conference Wi-Fi. This is an internal closed Wi-Fi that's connect to our C micro back there, all right? Rackspace, Rackspace. What's the SSID? All right, what's the password? All right, y'all are with me, good. Okay, um, you all are in luck. We prepared for about 120 people. All right, and we're a little shy, which means everybody can play, all right? So we got 120 accounts, so there's plenty for everyone. Um, we were gonna say feel free to share with a friend if we had more than 120 people, but if you wanna take two, go ahead and take two. Um, so there's plenty of space there, okay? So um, the team right now is handing out little slips that look kinda like the one you see on the screen up here, okay? Um, each of these slips will give you credentials to log into the cluster. You're going to notice your username in the gray box. And in this instance, sorry on the camera, my username is right there, OK? And then the password, and your password will be right there. Use the one that's on your slip, though. Don't use what's on my screen. This is just an example. Use what's on your paper slip, all right? Did everybody get one? Got a couple more over here. If you need a slip, let us know. Okay, you're going to use the IP address as well that you see on your slip, not the one on my screen, but the one that's on your slip, your IP address. And then once we get you logged in, if you want to actually hit Horizon on that server, you can use the IP address that is on your slip. So far, so good? Wi-Fi trouble? Right here? Okay. The, uh, the Wi-Fi does not have an internet connection, so I know Windows likes to complain about there is no internet connection. Um, it's a private network, okay? Oh, thank you. These guys are awesome here, see? Whoa, now I can point. 
Sorry, I'm excited about it. I don't know. If she, you know. This is great. I don't have to run down there now. All right. Anybody else have problems getting onto the Wi-Fi or connecting to their server? Excellent. Okay. So one last thing we need to share with you is the instructions for things that you can do on Nova. All these instructions are going to be located at training.rackspace.local. Training.rackspace.local, there'll be a PDF there. And in that PDF, we will have the instructions for the rest of our session this morning. That's training.rackspace.local. That is available on the, uh, the Wi-Fi network. You don't have to call it back on the internet, okay? Great point. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. All right, let's roll. Put that back up just in case anybody missed it. Questions, two questions here. Question? Yes. Uh, Rackspace, the Wi-Fi password? Uh, it should be on there. Yeah. Are you going to this IP address? You need help? Okay. So we'll, we'll do some of the exercises up on the projector here in a minute, um, as soon as we kind of help everybody out. One more? Be right there. If you are having problems resolving to training.rackspace.local, if you're having problems resolving to training.rackspace.local, try 192.168.2.250. Coming over. Anybody else having issues logging in? Yeah? Did you get a slip? Did you get a piece of paper? Yep. The one that says Horizon is going to be the dashboard. The other IP address is the one you'll SSH into to run the command line clients. OK? Oh, for, the, for the, uh, this, uh, 192.168.2.250. Should they be able to SSH by now? Yes. Got one that's hanging. Can I see your slip? No, no. Not able to shell into that. Okay, grab another one. Shelling into dot ten. Shelling into Were you SSHing to dot ten? Okay. Both Montana, you tried, and Chrome? Uh, Chrome, yeah. This is Chrome. It's Chrome. I mean, I think it's 
can do it the other way. And you're, you're on our Wi Fi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Yep. Yep. But you all work for the same company? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, you're done already? Okay. Oh, you're done already? Oh. The customers who've been here a long time. No, no. The new people get more. Yeah, I probably won't be able to back out the security yeah. on your machine. Um, if you can see if you can get to Horizon, or if it's just the PDF that's blocking, no, it won't. Horizon doesn't, or Horizon doesn't work either. Okay. Oh, you need one. Uh, okay, one second. Let me get that. One nine two one sixty eight two dot forty nine. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, across. Yeah. We just want to make sure that that server's up. Yeah, I think she's got the security policy on her laptop. Does anybody need uh, login information? Do they not have one? Right. Everybody will see it. <laughs> Is that in your way, bro? <laughs> oh, no, you're still serving also. Okay. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm gonna pull it yeah. up. All right. Pull mine up here. Everybody have login credentials for those who may have just walked in? Get you some. Good. In the back, too. Yeah, so it, Here's the way this works. For those who want to go at their own pace, you're more than welcome to get ahead of us and start to execute these exercises. But Byron's going to pull it up on the screen, too, if you want to follow along. So whatever you're most comfortable with. You can stay with us for a guided tour, or you can go off on a journey on your own. For those who just walked in, we have a Wi-Fi network. SSID that is broadcasting is Rackspace. The password is also Rackspace. Once you get on that Wi-Fi network, you'll need a little slip of paper that has your login credentials. John McKenzie in the center of the room there has those. If you need one, just raise your hand. Um, and those will allow you to log into our cluster. Once you've logged into our cluster, the instructions for using Nova, this PDF you see right here, is at training.rackspace.local. Or you can use the IP address, which is 192.168.2.250. And in just a moment, our tour guide, Byron McCollum, will give you a guided tour through these Nova exercises. OK. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is after you've connected to the Wi-Fi is we're going to SSH into one of the nodes in the back of the room. Um, so this is going to give you access to the OpenStack clients. So we're going to run through a lot of the command line tools. 
uh, first, uh, and then we're going to also take a look at the dashboard. Um, so let's go ahead and start now. The first thing we need to do is you're going to have to pull up a, either a terminal, if you're on Mac or Linux, uh, Windows, something like PuTTY, Secure CRT, um, some type of SSH client, okay? And we're going to SSH in. If you have your little slip here, uh, it's going to have your username and password. Uh, it'll also have an IP address. That's the IP address you're going to SSH into. That's the server, okay? So for me, that's going to be uh, 192.168.2.3. Uh, you may be on dot three as well. You may be on uh, some other node, okay? So I am OpenStack1 on dot three. And we're logged in. So you should also have in your home directory a uh, RC file, an OpenStack RC file. This has been created for you. Uh, all you need to do is source it, and then you can start using the OpenStack uh, command line tools. So that file contains all of our uh, credentials. It's going to prompt us for the password, um, but it has everything else in it. So if we just take a look at that. We can see we have our auth endpoint, uh, our tenant name, um, our username, and then it prompts us for our password. So, I'll go ahead and source that, and then it's gonna ask me for my password. All right, and then to just verify everything's working, I can run something like uh, glance image dash list. And we should see uh, one image already registered for us, okay? Is everybody able to do this? Anybody have any issues logging in, sourcing their credentials, start using some of the, the command line clients? Uh, explain a tenant? Sure. Uh, a tenant is uh, a way inside of OpenStack to kind of compartmentalize or segregate resources. Um, so some people like to think of them uh, they have several names. There's project, there's tenant, um, there's account. But basically what it is, it's a way to kind of organize or segregate resources. So if you're different departments inside of a company, those may be separate tenants or projects. Uh, if it's a public cloud or multi-tenant infrastructure, they may be different customers. Uh, or you might use them for different environments or different teams within your company, okay? Templates? It, it's, it's not a template. Um, it's just a way of organizing resources. You can think of them like uh, groups. Okay. All right. Um, so if we go back and look at our exercises, we can go ahead and start kind of going through here. So we've already done our first one, which is an image list. So we can see all the images that are registered in Glance. Uh, if we'd like to inspect one of those images, um, see a little more information about it, we can do a glance image show. See if I can put this here in my pocket. That works. Oop. So Glance Image Show is going to take uh, an image ID, and we can get that from the image list. Oh, I'm getting a lot of latency here. Okay. And it's going to tell us about that image. So what we have here is a Cirrus or Cirrus uh, image. It's a QCOW2 format. Uh, it's a very small kind of Linux image. It's used a lot inside of OpenStack for testing. Uh, boots up really quick. Um, has all the basic plumbing to test things like cloud init and uh, network connectivity and things like that. So, all right. So one of the first things we need to do before we can really start up an instance is we need to create some networks. So we're going to be using Neutron, um, formerly known as Quantum. Uh, in this case, the command line tools are still named Quantum, so we'll be using those. But just know that Quantum is the same thing as Neutron, it just got renamed, okay? So the first thing is a Quantum 
net create. That's going to create us a uh, private network. So this is a tenant network. It's isolated from any other tenant in the infrastructure. Phil. Oh, okay. Right now, what we've done is we've provisioned uh, system users on all of the compute nodes, so everybody has somewhere to log into, okay? Uh, normally, that's not something you would do uh, in a public cloud environment or in a, any cloud environment. Usually, people don't, your end users don't have access to the infrastructure. Here, um, just for the, the, the training lab purposes, because we wanted a known environment with everything installed and set up, okay. we just set up users on all the systems, okay? okay. <clears throat> So we may have some saturation on our network here. So if you're having problems connecting to the Wi-Fi, let us know. So I'm going to go ahead and create a network uh, with a quantum net create. And then uh, we can use a net list and a net show to kind of view those. Uh, you get to name it however you want. It's just a label. So I like to call this one uh, private. It's my private network. Yeah. Sorry about that. Byron, quick commercial. Login credentials for Horizon? Same as on the paper. Oh, it is the actual same one as the paper? Mm -hmm. uh, the SSH credentials are the same as the uh, Keystone credentials. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. All right, so I've created my network here. Uh, I'm also going to create a subnet. So the subnet is basically going to be your uh, block of IPs that you'd like on that, that private network. So we'll do a subnet create. And then you'll just tell it which uh, network it should be a part of. And then also the actual network CIDR um, that defines the size of the network. It's a, it's a quantum L2 network, yeah. Or neutron, sorry. Ah, I keep dropping off here. Yeah, we're having some, yeah. Byron, may I do a quick commercial? For those who may okay. have just stepped in, we have a Wi-Fi that we're trying to keep up at Rackspace is SSID, password is Rackspace. Um, it may be getting saturated a little bit. Once you log onto that, then you need a little paper slip that has your credentials, your username, and your password on that slip. So I'm gonna create my subnet here. Uh, give it a name, a uh, very creatively private subnet. I'm going to use the UUID from the network I previously created from the net create command, and then the CIDR for the size of the network uh, that I'd like to create for that subnet. And there we go. So we can see some information. Uh, whenever you create something uh, in Nova or Quantum, uh, you usually get some feedback, a uh, little bit of information. So we can see the allocation pools, the number of IPs available on that subnet. Um, whether we have DHCP enabled, what the gateway is, uh, whether it's IPv4, or v6, things of that nature. So I've got my network and I've got my subnet. And we can boot our first instance now. So to do that, uh, we need two things. One of them is we're going to need an image. We need an image ID. Uh, we also need a flavor ID. Um, if you're not familiar with what a flavor is, basically it's a, 
it's a uh, predetermined uh, collection or a predetermined uh, grouping of resources. So things like a certain set amount of a memory, certain number of vCPUs, local storage, things like that. And we can see a list of all those flavors and images with just the Nova image list and Nova flavor list. So we've got our one image, what we've seen before, um, but we also have our flavors here. There's two different ones. We've got a tiny, which is uh, 512 megabytes, and we have an extra small, which is uh, one gig. The uh, disk uh, doesn't, it's, not, it's unbounded, so it doesn't have a fixed size. It'll be as big as our image is, so that's why it says zero. And then so with those two items, we can go ahead and boot our instance, so I'll do that right now. So we need the image ID. And the flavor ID. So I'm going to do a extra small here, which is one gig. So flavor ID seven. And then the name of our instance. So my instance. And then we're going to get a response here. So Nova accepted our request, and we see a little bit of information about it. And in the background, it's going through uh, the process of actually spawning and building that instance. So we can do a Nova list here, and we see our instance is active, and we can see its IP address. Okay. And again, we can always uh, drill into any resource and see more information about it with a show command. So Nova show, and then the instance ID. And there we are. Okay. So a couple of uh, tools that are um, very handy. One of them is the console log. Um, so this is the, the, the log, uh, the boot log, if you will. Basically what you see on the screen um, whenever you uh, boot a server and it goes through and there's a bunch of stuff that flies past the screen, uh, you can get access to that log. And to do that, it's just the Nova console log. The flavor ID, or what is a flavor? Okay, well, uh, a flavor is basically, it's a, it's a predetermined set of uh, resource combinations. So basically, you can think of it a menu. Um, it's a set menu. Uh, you can spawn servers of these various sizes, you know, a certain amount of RAM, certain number of vCPUs, things of that nature. Um, if you do a Nova flavor dash list, uh, it should be the far left column. It's a really small, yeah. So we're going to do a Nova console log here with the instance ID. Question, comment here, Byron? Question? Yes, you can use the name. Um, not, not every command will accept the name. Um, also, there is no requirement that names are unique. So if you name two things the same name and you try to use the name to reference it, uh, Nova or some of the other clients will actually say, hey, there's more than one thing with this name, so you're going to have to go use the ID instead. But yes, you can use the names as long as they're unique. So we can see our console log here of our instance. Uh, you can get that from doing a Nova list. Or again, you could use the name. So that's the console log. We can also pull up a VNC connection to our instance. And that's a Nova git dash VNC dash console. And then the instance ID. 
And on the end of that, we need to tell it what type of VNC it is. Uh, in this case, we're configured for no VNC. So question, Byron, is there a way to use the VNC console without using that ugly ID hash? Can I use the name? Yes. <laughs> Simple answer, right? He's a man of many words. You, yes. Um, in most of OpenStack, you can use the names instead of the UUIDs if you make sure the names are unique. Okay. Otherwise, it'll just come back and say, uh, there's too many things with this name. I don't know which one you were talking about. Okay, it kind of bails. I don't know what your password is. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, the password for Cirrus. Cubs win. Smiley face. So we have our no VNC URL here. And we can copy that and then open it up in a browser. And that's going to be an in-browser VNC client. Now, you'll need a relatively modern web browser to uh, use this VNC client. Uh, it's built using uh, HTML5 Canvas. So all the drawing is done in the browser with Canvas. Uh, it uses WebSockets uh, to communicate with the VNC proxy back on the server. Um, and uh, all the client side is done in JavaScript, so the VNC protocol. It's kind of impressive. So we'll just paste that in here. Uh, Nova boot dash dash image ID, or the dash dash image? Dash dash image. Is it dash dash image? Yeah, we're having some serious latency problems now. <laughs> um, I am pulling up the VNC, the Git VNC console. I'm going to let that run in the background. That's taking a while. OK. So that's pretty much the basics. Pretty simple to boot up an instance. Just a Nova boot. You're going to specify a flavor and an image and give it a name. It's, it's not an extension. It's something that it, you install. So there's a, a Nova, no VNC proxy, and there's a package called no VNC. Yep, and it sets it all up. Um, it's also integrated into the dashboard. So if you pull up an instance in the dashboard, you can click on console, and it'll pull up the no VNC console right inside of Horizon. OK. Let me attempt this one more time here. There we go. So I was able to pull it up now. Um, so we have our, our VNC access to our instance here. And uh, I can go ahead and log in. So the username is Cirrus, C-I-R-R-O-S. Password is Cubswin, smiley face, without a nose. <laughs> Cubswin, colon, close parenthesis. Smiley face without the nose. Yeah. It, it also says it on the console um, when you pull up VNC. All right, so that's Nova. Um, we also have Cinder set up, so we can uh, attach some additional storage. So Cinder is the block storage uh, project inside of OpenStack. And uh, the flavors come with a certain amount of uh, storage, local storage, to run the instances on. Um, but if you want additional attached storage, uh, that's where you would use something like Cinder. 
And we can just do a sender create and specify how big of a volume we want to create in gigabytes. And then we're going to give it a name. Apologies for the S for the uh, Wi-Fi, folks. We are uh, yeah, it's hurting me too. Yeah. And then we can do a sender list and see our instance. Or, sorry, our volume here. Uh, we see the size, uh, whether it's attached to anything, um, status. So it's available right now. It's not attached to anything. So let's go ahead and attach. To do that, we actually need to use a Nova command instead of a sender command. Um, it's Nova volume dash attach. And then we're going to need two things. We're going to need an instance ID, so one of our running instances we'd like to attach it to, as well as the actual volume ID. And then the last little bit is the um, device inside the guest you would like that volume to appear as. Uh, we've got KVM configured. Uh, to just automatically assign that based off the next available one. So uh, we just use auto for that value. So a quick commercial, if we've lost any of you all completely, please let us know. Uh, we will come around and catch you up and uh, probably do this a couple of times to make sure everybody gets through. John, right here. The volume name? It's, you can pick it. anything that says name is something that you get to name it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Right. You get to think of it as um, like a USB drive or a USB thumb drive. Um, it's not shared storage, so we can't take it and attach it. It's not multi-attach. So I can't hook it to multiple instances, um, but I can unplug it from one and then plug it into another. Yeah. So it's persistent storage. If we destroy the instance, uh, the volume data and everything on it persists. Uh, persists. So yes. Hey, Vince, can you do me a favor? I'm right here. He can't see me. Huh? Um, can you take a look yeah. at 192.168.2.6? Tell me if she's alive. So what auto means is um, certain hypervisors let you specify the device name inside the guest. So like in Linux, dev, you know, VDA, VDB, et cetera. Uh, if you do auto, uh, it takes the next available one. So you don't have to actually know what's already in there and go specify it. Um, some hypervisors don't let you support specifying it. So in that case, you just use auto. All right. Uh, to create it, it shouldn't take very long. Yeah. How how big did you do? Yeah. No, it 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 should work.
All right, so at this point, let's go ahead and let's, let's try something different. Um, so we're gonna switch over to the dashboard. On your piece of paper, you should have a uh, URL for Horizon. And you can use the same credentials that are on here, the username and password to log into Horizon. We'll see if we have a little bit better uh, experience using that. Having a lot of latency issues using SSH. All right. So inside of here, uh, the first thing we get dropped onto is just the overview page. Um, how many people, just by show of hands, have not really uh, used Horizon before? Okay, so a good number of people. All right, first time. So I'll go ahead and just kind of talk through this. Uh, when you first log in, you're gonna see the overview. Uh, we see a little bit of information about our quotas or how many resources then uh, we've been uh, granted or allowed to use in, in, the, in the system, and uh, how much of those we're actually consuming at uh, this point in time. Um, so for this demo, we've set up, uh, for each of you, uh, the ability to spin up 10 instances, uh, 10 vCPUs, um, 10 gigs of memory, uh, 10 volumes, 10 gigs of local storage, or volume storage. And if we just kind of go down the left-hand side, let's see if I can make this... We can see our instances here. So here's the instance I created from the command line. Uh, we see its IP address and some information about it, the flavor that was used, its current state. Um, we can click in on it. Um, we've got some more details here. We can go into the log. So that's gonna, that's gonna be that console log that we did from the command line. And then we can also pull up the no VNC or the VNC console. Uh, we can also go down here and see all of our volumes that are created. If we wanna create a new one, we can do that from here. A Little bit easier in the dashboard. So here we just give it a name and the only required fields are name and size. So if I want to create another one. We'll also get projections on our new quota usage. So as I change the amount of gigabytes that this new volume will use, we can see our quota start getting filled in. Okay, so the green is basically gonna tell us um, new resources we're about to consume uh, and if you go over a quota, then it'll actually turn red. So here it's saying that we're trying to uh, build something that's gonna put us over our quota, um, so it won't allow you to do that. Uh, the type is a way of just uh, labeling uh, volumes. So for instance, uh, when you provision a volume, it's just gonna be a raw block device, it's unformatted, um, there's no partitions, no file system, nothing on it. Um, so uh, types are a way to indicate, oh, this is an ext3 uh, volume, um, or NTFS, or not NTFS, uh, FAT32, whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's none in there, so there isn't a way in Horizon, but you could do that from the command line. So there's a sender type create, I think it is, and you could create those. Yes? Yeah, the build request will eventually time out and then it'll go to an error state. Um, and then you can submit a delete request to terminate. Um, but I'm not sure if there's a way to kind of force it to say, if you've got something that's out there being processed to just kill it and just reap it. I don't, I don't, I don't know of anything that does that. Okay, I'm um, gonna jump down a little bit down to our network. So we created our network uh, previously, we can see that here, our private network. We can also see the subnet on it. And if we click in on that network, uh, well again, we'll see those subnets. We can create additional subnets. 
on that network. We can create additional networks. And if we go down to the network topology, there's a nice little graph here about uh, kind of showing what we have. Here we can see our private network. We have one instance attached to it. We can see the IP address, the name of the server, things of that nature. Uh, but we also have another kind of special network out here, uh, which is called an external network. Um, basically, it's a public network that gets us to outside of the cloud environment. So this might be the internet. Uh, it might be another network inside of your data center that has other resources, things of that nature. Um, so what we can do is if we go to routers, we can create a router and uplink our private network to that external network. Okay. So we'll go ahead and create a router, give it a name. And if we go into router, click on its name, uh, we're going to add an interface. Because right now we have a router, but it's not attached to anything. It's just kind of floating out there. So we need to start plumbing things together. So we're going to add an interface to our router. And we're going to see a list of our subnets. So we can go ahead and pick one of those subnets. Now, if you had different subnets on the same network, uh, normally they wouldn't be able to route between them because they're on different subnets. Uh, by creating a quantum router and attaching uh, interfaces for those two subnets, we're able to route between them, which is kind of neat. So we'll add our interface for our subnet. And if we go back to our network topology, we'll see we have a new router right here. But again, it's still really, it's not doing anything for us. What we want to do is take that router and hook it to our external network so our instances can get out. So we'll do that. I'll go back to my router. And from a router list, there's a set gateway. Set gateway. And that's going to ask us, well, which external network would you like to set the gateway for? Well, we only have one, which is our public network. It's kind of a shared network I've already created. So we'll say set gateway, and there it is. And when we go back to our network topology, we can see now that our private network is now, gateway has been set to the external network. Yes, I set that up. Yeah. Yes. Slightly different process for creating that. It's still a quantum net create, but there's a couple extra things. You tell it this is an external network um, that's basically shared by everybody, uh, that only routers can attach to it, things like that. Um, also, generally, you're going to disable DHCP because you're not having anything using DHCP attached to that network directly. So. All right, so now we've got our instance on our private network. We've got a router. The gateway is set to that external network. So that instance should be able to get out to that external network. So I'm going to attempt to pull up VNC again. We'll see if it's behaving a little better.
Okay. So one other thing, um, our instance is able to get out now. So it has outbound access to that external network. But it's still on that private network, and we have no way for traffic to be able to get in to that instance if we want to selectively allow that. So the way you do that in OpenStack is what's, what's called a floating IP. These are generally going to be public IPs. And the way it works is that I've created a pool of these IPs. So I have a set of IPs that are available um, for public access. And as a user, you'll go in and say, I would like one of those IP addresses. I would like to allocate one of them. Okay? So it'll come out of the pool, and the ownership will be transferred to you. And then from there, you can take that floating IP and say, I would like to associate it with one of my running instances. So what gets set up is effectively a, a, a NAT translation. So any requests any, that come into that floating IP will actually get forwarded to the private IP on the private network. Okay? So we've effectively allowed inbound access to our instances. That, that floating IP never gets configured on the instance. Okay? Um, it's just a NAT rule on the network node. So to do that, uh, we will go into access and security. Maybe. Ah, I dropped off again. Wow, what happened to the signal? Oh, I'm up there, okay. Let's try this again. Um, they're going, they're, uh, the way floating IPs work, you know how we created a private network and then we created a subnet, right? We, and we, there is where we specified a CIDR, a pool of IP addresses. You do the exact same thing. As an administrator, I'll go create an external network and I'll put a subnet on it. The CIDR I specify is going to be the IP addresses uh, that will be handed out as floating IPs. Yeah, I'm having some connectivity issues here again. Yeah, we're all hitting that. Uh, What's that? We're hitting that Wi-Fi uh, loveliness. Yes. Question here. I know. the The issue is all the other high power Wi-Fi that's. Uh, overpowering it. I think they're, it's like running on every single channel. Yeah. You can't, uh, there's nowhere to hide. All right, so I was able to pull this up. Under access and security, there's going to be a tab here that says floating IPs. And we're going to allocate an IP to my project or to my tenant. So I'll click that. It's going to ask us which pool we would like that IP to come from. Uh, in this case, it's going to be that public network. So I will say allocate IP. And here it's handed me an IP address. In this case, it's uh, 192.168.3.4. And so right now, I've basically just taken ownership of that IP address. Now I want to actually set up the connection between that public IP and the private IP of my instance. So to do that, we'll just say associate floating IP. It's going to say which floating IP. Well, I only have one. And then we're going to select what is known as a port, a quantum port. A quantum port is basically a, um, you could think of it as just a virtual interface. Um, it has a MAC address, and therefore it has an associated IP address. So we say which one we want. In this case, this is the instance I spun up earlier, and I'll say associate, and that's it. 
So now we would be able to get in to that instance from the external network, the public network. The one that's shown here, the floating IP. Can you? On the external side? Um, probably not. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's set up in IP tables to route the traffic to the actual private IP address. So if you're just handing out random IP addresses to things that are attaching to that external network, uh, the plumbing's not there to actually make it all work. Well, it's going to take everybody offline. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather not. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Apologies for the Wi-Fi. Um, there's there's a clear channel, but then we have to boot everybody off. So. Yeah, we're getting crushed. Um, For the volumes here, uh, this is that attachment. So I showed creating. Uh, attaching is just, just as easy. So we'll find our volume. We'll say edit attachments. And then we're able to, well, my instance is rebooting right now. Uh, but we'll be able to choose our instances, uh, any instance that's running. And it would attach that volume. We would still need to log in to the guest, to the instance, and mount it, format it, partition it, things of that nature. Because um, it is just a raw block device. except for all the connectivity issues. Anybody have any other problems? I know that's a huge problem. <laughs> Nothing right now. The, the Wi-Fi? No, it's not rebooting. Oh, 14 is not. Isn't that an option? It's, it's, it's probably because it's the regulatory domain is United States, but we're not in the US anymore, so. <laughs>
Yeah, I wanted uh, both of them up here. For those who may have joined us late, um, allow me to bring you up to speed on a little bit of, about the hardware that we're running this on, why Byron reboots uh, our Wi-Fi routers. So we're actually running this on an AMD C micro device, um, which is located in back of the room. And can I open it, Vince? All right, so everybody listen. Everybody listening? Are you listening? All right, stand by. One, two, three. So a, there's a data center back here, basically, that's been quiet this whole time. So everything you guys are running on is running off this awesome AMD C micro back here. 10 U chassis, 64 servers in this puppy. Not the Wi-Fi. Um, so, what's that? <laughs> Not the Wi-Fi. Uh, but the no. Wi-Fi, yeah. The Wi-Fi didn't come from C micro. No. <laughs> but um, when, when you get a chance, if you want to come back and take a look at this um, before you leave, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, Vince up front is a master magician behind this thing, so he's got questions. Oh, is that what did it? The VNC? Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so maybe I won't do that. Hey, Vince, you're getting questions back here, bro. Oh, you want to see it through the GUI? Yeah, I'll show you that. It's under access and security, and then there's this security groups here. So we can either edit the, the default group. No, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. You can go ahead and do it if you want. Yeah, it's ingress only. <laughs> oh, yeah, it seems to be running much faster now. Yeah, 
taste part of it because I own A and D stock. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Look, I saw one. Maybe I can, uh, can take it with me straight to me. <laughs> All right. So I've got my instance up and I've set up my security group rules. So we're allowing SSH and ping through. And I've associated my floating IP here to my instance. So I should cross fingers, be able to access my instance through its floating IP. So I'm just going to open up a new tab here. Again, this is on my Mac, not in the um, actually logged into the OpenStack server. <laughs> and of course, timeout. <laughs> yeah. Your floating IP is working? Yeah. Dashboard? Did you attach it? But you attached it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the uh, Nova volume attach. And then inside of there, uh, you can do a sudo fdisk dash L. Oh, it helps if I associate my floating IP. Yes. 
instance port ID. Sorry, who's asking that? Ah, uh, instance port ID. Uh, you can get that by doing a quantum port list. Uh, a port is a virtual interface. So basically, it represents a MAC address. Uh, and inside of uh, quantum, uh, obviously, a MAC address is then associated with an IP address. Do you have a running instance? It doesn't have a port then. Let me come see. Ah, there we go. So I'm able to get to my instance with so floating IP. Uh, the port ID from dot two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you got more than enough. Oh, did I get? Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay. It's a, the F two, F two E D D. That one. Oh, this is the one we want, right? That's now? the one. Yep. That's the port ID. except for some of the spotty Wi-Fi. Uh, so basically what I've done here is I have my instance. I'm going to pull up my network here. We've got our instance, which is 10.0.0.2. And we've got our router that's uh, connecting our private network to our external network. Uh, I took an IP address off of that external network. That's our floating IP. And I associated it with my instance. And so now. This is from my laptop, not from the C micro back there. Uh, I'm able to ping that instance. So I can SSH into it directly, too. So let me do that. So now I'm logged into my running instance. Now, we logged in through its floating IP. But if we do an if config, what do you expect to see? One interface, two interfaces? One. There's going to be one. And what's the IP address going to be? There goes the Wi Fi. <laughs> oh, this is really painful. Who provides that? Who provides the floating IP? Um, that's going to be whoever's running the infrastructure. Um, so the private networks we created, they're all virtual networks. They don't exist. Uh, they're, not, they're not physical. Uh, the external network uh, inside of quantum is kind of this virtual construct, but it's actually attached to a physical network. So the administrator will go create that network. Uh, they will attach it to the uh, physical interface um, the physical network, and on that network, you'll have a block of routed IP addresses um, that you would set aside for Nova, um, Nova floating IP or quantum floating IPs. Right. Quant quantum does all that. So quantum sets up all the NAT rules. So the traffic will come in to the quantum network server, uh, and there will be a rule for that particular floating IP and how to route it back to the actual instance on its private network. So quantum manages all of that. There we go. So uh, we can see that the IP address is 10.0.0.2. 
yet I SSH'd into it through its floating IP. Okay. Uh, we can also go out. So let's see if I can do this. So my max IP address is 192.168.2.141. Okay. So I'm inside of Cirrus right now, and let's see if I can get out. Okay, so I'm now uh, I SSH'd into my instance, but now I'm coming back out from my instance back to my Mac, okay, which is on that external network, if you will. So I could SSH. Oh, that's right. I turned SSH off. Yes. So we can see our instances can get out to that external network. We can also get into an instance through its floating IP. Does anybody have any issues with the floating IPs or not able to set that up? A couple of people. What's that? Okay. Phil's going to help you out. Right here. In the black and gray striped. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, all of your computers, your personal laptops, are actually on that external network. So you're, if you just figure out whatever IP address your, your uh, laptop has for your Wi-Fi connection, um, from your instance, you should be able to get to your personal computer. No? Does your router have the gateway set? But you were able to get in to your instance, right? Oh, I thought you said you could get into your instance. You had that working. Your floating IP? You can ping it. Are you trying to SSH to it? Do you have SSH server running? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the SSH inside of Cirrus, it might be the BusyBox one, so it, it, it probably doesn't have full, full features. So I've got my one instance here, and I've created my volume and attached it. Uh, and if we do a sudo fdisk-l, we should be able to see uh, VDA is going to be our root disk. So that's the one with the OS on it. That's what it boots from. Uh, we also have a dev VDB, which is the volume that I've attached to that instance. So right now, it's just a raw block device. Um, so we can either partition it, or we can just go ahead and lay a file system directly on it and mount it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that.
what's up? So you want to make a volume bigger? Yeah. Uh, one way of doing that is just making a volume snapshot. So you can go into your volume, uh, and then under uh, images, and sorry, yeah, volumes, um, what you'll have to do first is detach it. So you'll detach your volume, and then you can take a snapshot of it. Um, and then you can provision new volumes from the volume snapshot. And when you do that, you'll just specify the new size. Yeah, it creates a new one from a snapshot. Then you reattach it, yeah, back to the instance you want. Yep, that's the... That's, uh, yes, you can delete the old one then when you're done, yeah. Let's see. Tony one, okay. And then can you pull up the console on there? Or sorry, uh, view log. I just want to make sure it DHCP'd correctly. Yeah. And then uh, security groups. So if you go to, just scroll down a little. Ah, that's what you need. So if you go to access and security, See if you can ping it now. There it is. So if it was one more step, uh, yeah, the security groups. No, because you're, you're just creating policies, but you're not applying them to any instances. Yeah. So you'll need to go into the instance and say edit security group. Yep. All right. Hey gang, so we, we really appreciate y'all hanging out with us today and uh, dealing with us through the Wi-Fi. Apologies for that. Um, we're gonna be here for a little while until we get kicked out for the next session. So you can continue to play, but I don't have a pocket like Byron. Thank you, all right. Um, but did just wanna share with you all real quick, uh, what we've done for you, oh sorry, what we've done for you right now in very rapid pace, we're using the public or OpenStack public script. Um, what we've done with you in a very rapid time is uh, a quick glimpse of what you, you get for us in a live training class, um, which would usually take four days. Our fundamentals class, which we gave you in an hour and a half, uh, would usually happen over a four-day period, six hours per day. Um, and if you want more information about any of those training classes, 
You can find that information at training.rackspace.com. Um, all the classes we offer are listed here. OpenStack Fundamentals for those who are just getting started, but we also offer an OpenStack networking course, allow you to deep dive into networking, into Neutron. We have a Hadoop on OpenStack course, so anybody who's using Hadoop want to use it with OpenStack. We have a course that will walk you through that, a security in the cloud course. Uh, we have a building cloudy apps course for software developers. We also teach a Swift class. So there's a ton of classes there that are available for you. Uh, training.rackspace.com if you're interested. Um, if you have any questions about training at all, you can email us at training at rackspace.com. That email goes to all of your instructors here, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you. So thank you again to uh, Vince and the rest of the team at AMD for that C-Micro. Um, next time, we'll get somebody to sponsor our, our Wi-Fi that we, that we bring in. All right, we appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.